Gary Suitcase Smith was one of hockey's most colorful goaltenders in the 1960s and 70s. Gary was the subject of many wild stories during his 14-year career, but his unlikely rise from out-of-work and out-of-shape retiree in 1978 to WHA champion in 1979 may have been the craziest tale of them all. In the 12 months in between, he was teammates with 17-year-olds Wayne Gretzky and Marc Messier, won a Central League championship, suffered a franchise folding, weathered a franchise merger, signed an NHL contract on a napkin, and, luckily, listened to a wife who was not yet ready for Gary to be a stay-at-home husband. We'll pick up the story late in 1978, when Smith was returned to the last place Minnesota North Stars after he had worn out his welcome with the Washington Capitals. Little did Gary realize that the North Stars GM Lou Nanny acquired him only to ensure the team obtained the services of another player named Smith. We're back with Minnesota, Team Minnesota, with them. And this is funny, so he plays me in three games. Uh, first three games, I'm there for three games. And I played great in Minnesota. We win one, we lose one, and we tie one. And I was second star of all three games. Wow. And I think they scored three goals on me in, in each game. And uh, so Louie comes down to me. We're in St. Louis. And Louie comes down to me after the game. He said, what the hell are you doing? And I said, I don't know. I said, I, I, I think I'm playing pretty good. And he says, we're trying to lose. We're trying to be in last place to get Bobby Smith in the, in the draft, the first, the first player in the draft. He said, I'm going to send you to Fort Worth. And uh, and uh, so we can finish in last place. So that's why he got me. They wanted to finish in last place. And I said, Louie, I said, I've got a little left in the tank. And uh, he says, well, we're going to Fort Worth, and uh, they got a, a team there that's fighting to make the playoffs, and they got a pretty good shot at it, I think. So we go down to Fort Worth. Louie and I go down on the plane the next morning from St. Louis. And I signed a contract with Louie, a two-year contract, Seventy-five thousand a year on a napkin uh, while we're having a cocktail on the plane. So he says, just try to play last season down here, help these guys. And you got a two-year contract when you come back. So I signed it on a napkin. <laughs> so I go down to Fort Worth and I can play there for fun. It's the minor leagues, and I'm still I can still play in the uh, NHL. And so I go down there and we play good and. Uh, and Billy McMillan is our coach, and he's a guy I played at St. Mike's with. So he lets me do what I ever want and everything, and he plays me all the time, and I'm having a great time going down there playing for fun. And uh, we win the championship down there. And then so I go back to Lake Tahoe, and uh, during the summer, they, got, they finished in last, and they dropped Bobby Smith, which was a good draft. And the team they beat out for finishing last was Washington. Uh, so I, I hear on the TV that somehow Cleveland and Minnesota have merged and they're the same team. So I called Louie. I said, Louie, what about this contract that we signed on the, on the uh, plane? And he said, uh, well, I never registered. I never put it. I forgot about it. I never registered it. He said, I don't know if I'm going to have a job. So he said, I'll get back to you. And uh, so then he gets back to me and he says, well, it turns out I'm lucky enough to have a job. And we inherited eight goalies from Cleveland, or maybe it was five goalies from Cleveland and three from Minnesota. So we have eight guys under contract. And the guys under contract from Cleveland were Jim Loss and that guy Jim Craig, who was on the Olympic team, and a couple other guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, Minnesota had three guys in under contract, including Peter Lepresti and I don't know who, Paul Harrison, I think. And uh, so he can't can't give me a job. And uh, so anyway, he says, I'll try to find you a job somewhere else. So he finds me a job. He calls Pat Staples and he finds me a job in Indianapolis the next year. So now I'm in Indianapolis. <laughs> and what a, it's interesting. You mentioned 
the Indianapolis racers. Who would have ever known as you, and I, I'm curious a little bit about the team because it, it fell apart quickly with Nelson Scalbania. But at the same time, unbeknownst to anybody, you're playing with two players who are 17, 18 years old, who would eventually become number one and two in the all-time NHL scoring uh, records, Wayne Gretzky and Mark Messier. Can you talk a little bit about the first time you saw Wayne Gretzky and what your thoughts were? Yeah, the first time I saw him is uh, I drove all the way from Lake Tahoe, and it was the day before training camp started. And uh, so I just brought my stuff down to training to training camp, my equipment. And so I, I uh, heard of Wayne Gretzky, and um, I uh, brought my equipment into the dressing room. And uh, so I watched them practice because I got there late after drive. It wasn't it was like training camp wasn't starting till the next day. And so I just brought my stuff into practice, and then I went out and I watched them. And his father was there, and his mother, and I think his little brothers and sisters and stuff like that. But I watched them, and I took a look at them, and I said, "Yikes! <laughs> Is this kid something?" And uh, I said to myself, "I'm going to be nice to this kid." And uh, like I was just training camp playing with before training camp playing with some of the guys that are going to be on the team, and those guys have been in pro for many years, and and he's 17 years old or 18 or whatever he was anyway. Messier wasn't there that day, but but Gretzky, I thought, holy cow, is this guy going to be great? And um, then it it seems to me. I don't know. No, I was going to say something about Messier because I'm, I'm trying to think when he got there. I don't think he was there at the start of the year, but he may no. have been. No, he wasn't. So he wasn't at no. the start of the year? I don't know. They came later. I yeah, know. okay, he came later. And uh, so I went in, I did introduce myself to Wayne, and I said, uh, uh, I said I'm pleased to meet you, Gary Smith, and stuff like that. He, and he said to me, pleased to meet you, Mr. Smith. He says, uh, he said, yeah, I went to your first game uh uh, or my first game I saw in the NHL, my grandmother uh, uh, brought me to, uh, we were up in the Grays at Maple Leaf Gardens, and uh, you were playing, you were playing for the Seals against the Leafs, and uh, very pleased to meet you, and, and great to be playing on the same team, both of playing the t- same team together, and just treated me great, but I was like treated like a father, I would be his father or something. Uh-huh. Right. You know, so I was really nice with him. Pat Stapleton, uh, was the coach and general manager, and he, he put me with Gretzky, or put Gretzky with me to room with when we went on the road. So uh, uh, I tried to teach him, you know, how to be a pro, and uh, it was just really nice to him, and we got along great. And it was just had a great time the little time I was there with him. And I remember the first game we played, and uh, it was against Winnipeg, and uh, I had played with uh, Bobby Hull, uh, and and. Uh, Chicago, as we mentioned earlier, and uh, Gretzky was playing. I think they both got, I'm not sure, but I think they both got a hat trick, or hat, hat trick, but or one of them got a hat trick and one of them got a couple of goals. And, um, but we had, in Indianapolis, we were, the old guys like me and a bunch of other old guys were near the end of their career. And the young guys, like Gretzky, the other guys coming up. So it was kind of a mishmash up there, but we all got along great, and it was the only time I saw the WHA, the first time I saw the WHA. And, um, you know, we weren't good enough to compete there. And uh, also Scalbania, all he was doing was show, showing off Gretzky so he could get him somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And the team was destined to go under from the day we got there. Um we never got paid like our meal money for training camp and we missed our paychecks and stuff like that. So it was kind of like a bad deal in uh, Indianapolis. And then they traded, um, and I was a good friend of Whitey Stapleton and another guy, Rod Zane, a friend of mine from Ottawa, he was the assistant GM. So I basically knew what was going on and they were just, we were hanging on for dear life and where we would get our paychecks from and when we'd get them and, and things like that. So then, then they sold Gretzky, and that was it. And we played three home games after they sold Gretzky, and a guy named Peter Driscoll and Eddie Meal, and uh, they went to Edmonton. And then we never got paid for the three games, and they pulled the plug. Oh. And uh, they, we folded. So I had to drive with my family back two cars back to... Uh, 
Lake Tahoe from uh, Indianapolis. And um, I remember going, getting my equipment and uh, taking my sticks and stuff from there in case I might ever play again. And then there was two sweaters hanging there that weren't there. There was Messier and... Uh, no, I guess, well, Messier, well, he'd already gone or something. He was, he was still with us. So it was only one sweater. It was Gretzky's sweater. And I said, uh, should I take this sweater? <laughs> and uh, I said, no. I said, it's not my place to take it. So I left it there. And uh, I took my sweater. So then, anyway, I went back to Lake Tahoe for uh, uh, several months. And my wife was always bugging me, get a job, get a job get a job, this team lost, call there and see if you can get a job. And so on, on um, Super Bowl Sunday, Winnipeg has had lost the night before, uh, and it was Super Bowl Sunday, and she was bugging me, and she said, why don't you call Winnipeg? They, they lost, like, they need some help and goal. And this was... Two, at least two months after I had played. Mm -hmm. So um, I, but I want to get it the hell away from her because she's bugging me so much. <laughs> so, so I called Winnipeg Jets, and thinking that nobody's going to be in the office on the Sunday morning of the Super Bowl. And so I called them, and a male answers the phone. He says, "Hello," and I said, "There's John Ferguson there." He says, "Speaking." So wow. I say, oh, no, to myself. I said, John, it's Gary Smith. I was wondering, I see you got beat last night. I was wondering if you needed any up and goal. <laughs> so he said, hey, Freddy, how you doing? And I said, uh, well, I haven't been, you know, I've been trying to get a job somewhere. And he said, well, he says, you know, I got two goalies here. And he said, I like one of them, and I'm not so happy with the other one. He said, I'll think about it. So the phone rings at about a week later, and uh, when I thought there was a chance that I could play, I went out to uh, uh, Squaw Valley Arena, and I tried to play just at pickup hockey, and I couldn't stop a balloon. I hadn't played in two months, and I had ballooned up to about 240. And uh, so anyway, he did call me a week later. He said, can you be in, uh, in Winnipeg tonight because we're going on the road or maybe tomorrow night because we're going on the road for a week and I want to get you organized. And uh, he says, I'll give you 10000 for the rest of the year. There was like only about eight games or something the rest of the year and I just wanted to get the heck out of there. Mm -hmm. So uh, out of Lake Tahoe. And so I said, okay, I'll go. So I go and it's, uh, it's uh, land in Winnipeg and it's 40 below. And so I get a uh, drive to the hotel and the next morning, I got to go to the rink, and I got and I can't get a cab because the cabs they aren't even starting. So I go there, and I'm late for practice. I had to drag all my equipment across from the hotel, which is, you know, about a, maybe a half mile of rink at 40 degrees below wow. zero. I had to drag my pads and everything and equipment over there, so I don't make it for practice. And uh, so I see Fergie sitting up there watching practice. So I go up and I talk to him. He said, "Okay, ten grand a year for the rest of the year." He said, "I want to pr I want you to practice with with uh, uh, the University of Winnip Winnipeg. We're we're leaving uh, the, the next morning. Uh, we're playing that that they played that night anyway. So it was the next morning. I guess I dragged my stuff across there and I talked to Fergie." But the night before they played Edmonton, so I go across. I go w watch the game. And uh, so it wasn't the next day till I dragged my equipment off there. So uh, anyway, uh, so then after the game, I went out with the Edmonton guys, Gretzky, and uh, Nace Bailey that I had played with in Washington. And so we go out, and the next morning, I, I drag myself across. So then they leave. And then so I'm supposed to, the next morning, I wake up after they've left, and my foot is hurting like mad, and I can't even walk. And... Uh, so I I can't practice with Winnipeg or the uh, university, and uh, so I'm there all week. And I call somebody from the office, and I can't get a hold of everybody's gone. And so about Monday till Thursday, I finally get over hold of somebody in the office, and they set up a a uh, doctor's appointment when I can't even walk, and I go to see the doctor, and the doctor says you've got gout, and he gives me a couple of pills, and the gout 
is better. So, uh, but I hadn't practiced with anybody. And, but the night after I went to to the game, I went through the wives' room, and it's getting a little jumbled, but who do I see in the wives' room? It's Tommy McVie, after I had already agreed to, I guess I didn't agree till the next morning to sign with him for 10 grand, but who do I see is, but Tommy McVie in the dressing room, in the wives' room, after I'm leaving the dressing room of the, of the Jets. So I said, Tommy, I said, what are you doing here? And he said, uh, I came for the weather. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty below. And uh, so anyway, then I go to practice the next day late, and I see Fergie there, and I agree to stay for, you know, till they come back. So they come back, and I haven't practiced at all. And Fergie, the coach was Larry Hillman at the time. And he says to me, he said, Fergie, he said, how are you? I said, I haven't played for two months, three months. I'm not ready to play. And uh, he said, okay. He says, Fergie told me to play you. And he said, but, so I'm not going to play you. I'm going to dress you. But I'm not going to play you. So Joe Daly, I think, plays. And... Uh, uh, so anyway, then they fire Larry Hillman that night after the game. And who is the coach but Tom McVie? They announce him as the coach the next day. Mm-hmm. And if I had ever known that Tom McVie was going to be the coach, and I probably should have known because I did see him there a week earlier before they went on the road, I would have never played for the Winnipeg Jets. <laughs> right. Because of my experience in Washington. Now, he is a good friend of mine, Tom McVie, but I wasn't able to go through that again. I wouldn't have been able to go through what I had to go through in Washington again, and I would never have done it. So here I am, and I have to go through it again. So here I go through the same things, 30 pounds overweight, trying to get me down and doing all these extra things that you have to do to lose the 30 pounds, and to get yourself in shape to play, and I go through it, and I go through it, and I go through it, and there's about four games or five games left in the year, and he, we played a game against, uh, an exhibition game against uh, Finland. Some team from Finland, mm-hmm. and he puts me in there. He figures it's a good time to put me in there, and I... So I I play. I remember breaking my blade on my skate during the game. My blade was broken, and I had to play in a broken blade. And I think I thought it was going to break my ankle and break my leg, but I didn't want to be taken out of there. So I played half decent, and then the guy uh, fixed the blade on my skates, put a new blade on for the for the next practice the next morning. So he plays me in a lead game, and I play all right. And I'm still going through all this stuff in practice, having to play way harder than everybody else. So then I play another game, and I play all right. Then I play another game, and I play all right. So then the playoffs start, and we win four straight against Quebec, and he plays me. Right. Then we got to play against Edmonton, so he plays me. I went into Edmonton and played the two best games I've ever played in my life in Edmonton. And... Or in the first game, the first two at home, no, the first two games in Edmonton. We're in Edmonton, and I played the two of the best games I've ever played in my life. So we come back, and I think just what was going on hits me, and I played terrible in Winnipeg. So we're up two to one. Then we play the third game, and we win it. So we're going back to Edmonton. I I think maybe one game, one uh, one of the two games at home anyway. So we go back to Edmonton, and we lose badly there. And then I'm wondering if he's going to play me at home. He plays me at home. And Terry Ruskowski had a real bad shoulder, and he came back and played really good. And it was real lift that he played. And we beat them, and, and we, we beat them. We win the AFCO Cup in Winnipeg. If we would have went to another two games in Edmonton, we would never would have beat them. Mm-hmm. As, uh, you know, they were so good. And it just worked out that we beat them. 
and Tom McVie did it to me again, <laughs> you know. And uh, like I got to thank him and thank him, thank you, Tommy, for doing it. But I never would have done it if you, I knew you were the coach. I would have quit. Thanks for watching this episode of PHA TV. Please hit the subscribe button and never miss a classic hockey video.